The yield curve has never been this inverted without having a recession. And then you have banks tightening lending standards. Banks see the problems and they are reacting to it, contrary to what some of their public comments are. We've never had such an aggressive bank tightening lending standards, uh, restrict, starting to restrict loans without having a recession. So it doesn't mean, again, it's today or tomorrow, but over the next 12 to 18 months, odds are, yes, we move into a recession. What's the delay and what's the outlook? Nancy Lazar on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Why isn't the U.S. economy in a recession? or at least slowing down? That is a question being widely debated among economists. The U.S. economy is stronger than just about anybody anticipated at this point, including the Federal Reserve. In his recent testimony to Congress, Fed Chair Jerome Powell cautioned, the latest economic data have come in stronger than expected, which suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than previously anticipated. As the late renowned academic economist Rudy Dornbusch famously said, no post-war recovery has died in bed of old age. The Federal Reserve has murdered every one of them. While the Jerome Powell Fed is certainly doing its darndest to slow, if not end, this recovery, which has been surprisingly resilient, despite one of the fastest, most aggressive bouts of rate hikes in the Fed's history. It's even being called the Godot Recession, highly anticipated but nowhere to be seen. What explains the economy's resilience and when and where will these rate hikes start to bite? Our guest is leading Wall Street economist Nancy Lazar, who is chief global economist at Piper Sandler, where she leads the economic research team. Before joining Piper Sandler, Lazar was chief global economist and head of economic research at the highly respected independent macro research firm Cornerstone Macro, which she co-founded in 2013. And prior to Cornerstone, she was co-founder and vice chairman of ISI Group for more than 20 years. Lazar has been an institutional investor-ranked economist since 2001, placing in the top two the past 10 years and ranking number one in 2015. She has also been on Barron's 100 Most Influential Women in U.S. Finance in 2020, 2021, and 2022. And we are delighted to say that she has been a wealth track guest for years. I asked Lazar to explain the economy's resilience. I'd say there are three main reasons why the U.S. economy has been so resilient, just uh, despite the fact the Fed has been raising rates very, very aggressively. First and foremost, we eased very aggressively in 2020 and in 2021. We put trillions of dollars into the economy, and quite frankly, it's still in the economy. I call that legacy liquidity. Uh, second, we had low, very low interest rates for a very, very long period of time. And consumers uh, fixed up their balance sheets, companies fixed up their balance sheets. And so you've not yet fully felt the, the lagged effects of the Fed tightening cycle. On average, it takes about a year. And so we're probably going to start to see more signs of strain as we go into uh, the second and third quarter. Third, there is a secular support for the U.S. economy, something we've called the manufacturing renaissance. I've talked to you about it before at Consuelo, mm -hmm. um, and that is creating an awful lot of jobs for the manufacturing sector, non-residential construction, and there's a huge job multiplier associated with it. So really those three things, legacy liquidity, uh, the effect of the Fed tightening cycle hasn't yet uh, been fully felt by any stretch, and a secular support, the manufacturing renaissance. And you've written about sticky inflation. So how sticky is inflation and why does it seem to be so intractable? Well, in part because of those three uh, forces, yep. in particular, the massive amount of liquidity uh, put into the economy, which is still in corporate balance sheets. Companies still have uh, above and beyond uh, growth in revenues, very, very strong revenue growth, about 8%, with a level of revenues higher than what they have been historically relative to previous trends. The same is for consumers. Because companies have so much revenue, they're willing to hire people and they're willing to give big pay increases. And so even consumer income is higher than it would have been had we not had the COVID crisis. So 
Uh, this legacy liquidity is driving business decision making. It's keeping the job market stronger, longer, wages higher. It's driving consumer spending. Um, and also consumers have a lot of uh, excess savings. And so they're not as sensitive to higher prices because their income and savings are so abundant. And so they're willing to incrementally pay higher. Now there are early signs that this is starting to fade, but this leg legacy liquidity could make it tougher for the Fed to really cool inflation. Let's talk about where you're seeing signs of problems with consumer credit. You are uh, starting to see signs of financial strains on the consumer balance sheets. Auto loan delinquency rates for subprime loans okay. uh, have, have soared back up to their pre-COVID level just before 2019. If you look at aggregate uh, delinquency rates, they're still very, very low. But what will happen over the next year as these higher rates start to uh, be more clearly felt by the consumer and if income starts to slow, uh, you'll see more and more delinquencies. You wrote sent a report to clients recently, and the headline was financial strains always unfold with higher rates. And when you wrote that report, actually some financial strains were definitely happening. We had the, the failure of, um, of the Silicon Valley Bank, the, supposedly the second worst bank failure in U.S. history, and a crypto bank went under, and everyone said, oh, well, that's just a one-off. But are these canaries in the coal mine? Absolutely. Weak links always crack first. I'm not a bank analyst, but in, in listening to other people, neither of them were particularly uh, strong. And they were very, very much tied to the liquidity that the Federal Reserve and federal government put into the economy. They were huge beneficiaries of that liquidity. And so as the Fed is starting to take that uh, money out, uh, again, we, we will probably see more strains uh, within the financial markets particularly those that grew egregiously relative mm -hmm. to their previous trends um, and were unsustainable business platforms. Where are the other weak links? I mean, what, what are you tracking? What sectors of the economy? What, you know, what particular industries? Well, in the technology space, uh, they were huge beneficiaries of when we were all staying at home, both be it our devices um, and so both, both services and, and hardware. And you see an enormous surge in their profitability, which again, isn't sustainable as the economy slows. Second, within the consumer discretionary space, uh, they were also huge beneficiaries, and they still are. Many of these companies have been raising prices. Retailers have been raising prices dramatically. And as a result, they've not had to cut uh, uh, jobs. Mm -hmm. Employment in the retail space has actually been pretty high, rose sharply in February. But as the Fed uh, is going to be successful in slowing inflation, you will see more and more profit margin problems as companies uh, have way too high compensation what they've been paying workers relative to previous trends. And you're already starting to see it in the tech space, um, but you're gonna see uh, more profit problems over the next year in the consumer discretionary space. Nancy, I, I, I wanna mention some of the things that you've been writing clients about as well and some other areas, commercial real estate. And you know, one of your reports, major investors are writing off some properties, PIMCO and Brookfield among them. So what's going on with commercial real estate? And again, how worrisome is that? Well, that is just another canary in the coal mine. If you take a step back, what's happening with a lot of these office buildings? Vacancy rates are going up, rents are going down, so income associated with these buildings is declining. At the same time, the cost of carrying these buildings is going up uh, as a result of the surge in interest rates. So quite frankly, it was, I think it's a fiduciary thing for these businesses to uh, step away from these mortgages and try to restructure them because they're very, very unprofitable. So it's not really a sign of financial strains for those in, in individual companies, right. it's more of a sign of a financial strain within the office space. And banks are responding to it. Banks are cutting lending standards to these um, uh, for commercial real estate. And so that is likely to continue to be a pro one of those other problems um, outside of the consumer space over the next over the next year. This is a very slow moving. This is not like 0809, where you had two grenades thrown at the economy, Lehman and Bear. These are more gradual deteriorations in economic activity, which we've seen before. This is not unusual in recessions. To tell us about that, because I, I know you're calling it a slow dance into recession. What do you think it's gonna look like? What are the historic parallels? 
Well, it looks a little bit like 2000, 2001, when you had the tech bubble and the Federal Reserve was tightening. And as that bubble burst, you had basically two legs down in the stock market uh, with the, quite frankly, the recession wasn't that severe, but uh, S&P earnings plunged about 40%. Um, and that contributed to the sharp decline in the stock market. Real GDP barely declined. It really, really was associated with the tech bubble and what it did to earnings and what it then did to the stock market. Then there's also 1973, 1974. That's where you had sticky inflation. You didn't yes. have inflation in 2000, 2001. Um, and again, it took a very dramatic tightening cycle, a surge in the unemployment rate, really to get uh, inflation squeezed out just cyclically. It came back again, but just cyclically, it took a very significant recession um, and a, a, a very big increase in the unemployment rate, along with a very sharp drop in earnings and also the stock market. We're probably in between those two. Inflation is not as bad as it was in 73, uh, 74. Thank goodness it is sticky. Um, and therefore, I do think the Fed is going to have to continue to tighten. Uh, more than people generally expect. And with real GDP go going down roughly minus one percentage point, we have the unemployment rate moving up to four and a half, but that's not anytime soon. Again, that will happen later this year into 2020, into 2024, as you said, we're calling this a slow dance, but that, that will be the trajectory. So it's not clear it's gonna be a real severe recession, more severe than 2000, 2001, probably not as severe as 73, 74, uh, but at the end of the day, we are very worried about earnings. They are mm -hmm. in a bubble, um, and we do think they drop sharply, um, and, and that creates tremendous risk for the market. Because one of the interesting observations that you've made that is really counter to what I hear from a lot of um, analysts, basically, you know, everyone says, look, you know, corporators are still very strong, but you're basically saying on a real basis, excluding uh, inflation, that corporate earnings are actually declining. Is that right? Again, companies are supporting their revenues and their earnings by raising price. Um, uh -huh. And if, if, if the Fed is out there to slow inflation increasingly, you'll have more and more companies who won't be able to do that. It's starting. It started in the used car space, for example, but even that has stalled. Used car prices have turned back up. And so it just highlights how much liquidity there is in the economy and the consumer's willingness to pay. So uh, it is going to be a slow dance into a recession. Right now, the economy could appear to be okay. Yeah, I mean, is there any possibility that this could be the Godot recession, as the Wall Street Journal put it in a headline, where a recession that, you know, that you keep waiting, but it never shows up? I mean, is that possible that we could escape a recession? So we have some really good leading indicators for the economy. Other people yep. certainly use similar tools. Um, but our recession risk index is, 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 has never been as high as it is today without having a recession. Okay. Um, within it, you have the inverted yield curve. The yield curve has never been this inverted without having a recession. And then you have banks tightening lending standards. Banks see the problems and they are reacting to it, contrary to what some of their public comments are. Um, we've never had such an aggressive bank tightening lending standards, uh, restrict, starting to restrict loans without having a recession. So it doesn't mean, again, it's today or tomorrow, uh, right. but over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, odds are, yes, we move into a recession. So earnings basically drive the markets. So what are the implications at this point for the financial markets, for the stock markets first? So not only are real earnings down, if you take a, a closer look at earnings, which we've done even sequentially, quarter to quarter, they are declining. They started to decline in, in at least into uh, 2022. So first, even nominal earnings are edging lower. Analyst earnings estimates for this year are still way too high for this year, let alone 2024 are way too high. Um, companies, if anything, are trying to, they say, well, things are tough in the first part of the year, but they're going to get better in the second half of the year. We totally disagree with that. They will be worse in the second half of the year. So it's as if, it's as if companies aren't preparing uh, for that slowdown in the economy, which means they're not going to be cutting costs quick enough. And so we have earnings down this year about 10%. And quite frankly, at this stage, they're going to be down again in 2024, at least the first half of 2024. Why aren't company patchments responding to what you're seeing why are they so still so optimistic there's one particular company that i've that i've i've looked at and if five years ago if you had a trend line for your the, the dollar value of your revenue you're currently 16 billion higher than that and so as a cfo you think you're a genius and that you have a great platform 
and in turn, you're hiring more people and you're paying them more wages. So it really goes back to, I hate to sound like a broken record, uh, the leg legacy liquidity issue, that these elevated levels of revenues in the consumer space and in the industrial space are supporting jobs and compensation. But the bulk of that increase in revenues for, for many companies, not all, but for many, um, is inflation. That is, real mm -hmm. revenues are actually already stalling out. And so as the Fed continues to tighten, uh, you, what you will see is more and more companies start to lay off. Now, there's one sector where revenues are already deteriorating, and that is in, I call them tech media. Um, and in those tech media companies that are very, very tied to the advertising space, those revenues have already started to decline. They don't have pricing power uh, like some of the consumer discretionary space does, and they're already starting to lay people off. You you know who they are. Like Netflix or? I mean... uh, Netflix, um, uh, Meta, uh, uh, Alphabet, um, Got it. Even, even an Amazon. Um, that's more of a, of a tech retailer, e-commerce retailer. And so in that space, you are starting to see revenues deteriorate, actually literally decline, and that's where you're getting the layoffs. Revenues are very bloated. It's holding down compensation ratios. It's holding down interest expense ratios. Very, very low, very, very low, um, giving companies comfort that they don't have to restructure today. But again, over the next year, we think that's going to increasingly spread to more and more sectors of the economy as pricing power gets more and more difficult. Fed is key, obviously, to what happens, uh, how severe a recession that we're going to have. Uh, so what's your reading on what the Fed's policy is going to be and if, if they are, in fact, you know, going to tighten for as long as it takes to get inflation down? Is 2% inflation still even a realistic goal? So uh, a year ago, by now, the community expected the Fed actually to be easing. Obviously, they're not. They're still tightening. Right. So why? I always try to figure out if things are different than you expect, why are they different? And they're different because of this massive amount of stimulus that they put in place that is still in the economy. And there's something in our world called nominal uh, income. That's how we're all paid. We all get nominal dollars. Real is when you take inflation out of that. But our nominal income growth right now is still about 7%. And that's true for the entire economy, not just consumers, but on balance for nominal G GDP. And then if interest rates are 4.5%, which Fed funds today are, that's still low relative to that income growth. Mm -hmm. And historically what you've seen, uh, you've had to see the level of Fed funds get higher than that income growth on a sustained basis to really squeeze inflation out of the economy. Now that's where the commercial real estate space is really, really important because that's exactly what's happening in that space. Um, incomes are declining for office buildings and interest rates are going up and you're, getting, uh, you're, you're seeing uh, uh, strains. For the overall economy, that is not the case. Um, and so we think Fed funds probably need to move up towards 6%, but it's going to be contingent on what nominal growth does. If nominal growth stays uh, sticky, then they'll probably have to go higher uh, than even a 6% interest rates to make sure you successfully squeeze out inflation. If you don't, you risk keeping the economy too strong with inflation coming back uh, relatively quickly as the unemployment rate moves back down. As dire as this sounds, there would be nothing more dire than to repeat the 1970s, where you had high inflation and high unemployment. And so short-term pain, um, business cycles, recessions uh, do serve a purpose as far as resetting the foundation, uh, putting in place some economic slack, i.e. higher unemployment, where the economy can reaccelerate and it can even be better than it was the past decade. And, and that, is, that is our outlook. But near term, uh, I would say, let's take the pain now so we can ensure we can have another decade of great growth. And it sounds as if, you know, that Jerome Powell is on that page and the Fed is on that page, at least so far. They seem to be pretty, you know, dug in as far as their determination to not repeat the 1970s. I was very pleased with Chairman Powell's um, a testimony recently, uh, exactly. He understands the importance of getting down to that 2% inflation target. Yes, you should get down to that 2% inf inflation target. They would lose credibility if they didn't uh, stick with that 2% inflation target. And, uh, and, and so he understands the risk to his legacy, to, but more importantly, to the economy. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think in the heart of hearts, they all want to make sure the economy can have another decade of great growth. One of your most enduring themes, you, you mentioned it before, was the manufacturing renaissance in the U.S. Is that still on track? 
Well, it, it's been on track for about a decade. It's, we mm -hmm. started that theme back in 2010. And if anything, the COVID crisis, and along with China uh, and, 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 and now Russia, um, have all reinforced the need to increasingly do onshoring, uh, actually manufacture here in the United States. So, uh, and, and to be sure, even Washington has gotten to the mix, but it was tr started by the private sector, which is key. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the, even the federal government, obviously, with the CHIPS Act, uh, some infrastructure uh, bills. So yes, it's full throttle. It's very, very powerful theme. And one of the things that's keeping the economy stronger longer. You've also been a big proponent of the U.S. continuing to be, you know, the economic driver of global growth, contrary to what many people have been predicting, as you know, for over a decade, where this century was going to be the China century. How's that going? We're still, we still very, very much believe in that the United States is going to be the driver of uh, global growth. Why? We're energy independent, uh, too. We are the leader in digitization uh, in technology. Three, uh, Europe doesn't have any energy and China is a bad actor. Um, and so we are still the largest economy in the world. We are the largest consumer in the world. And there's nothing more powerful for an economy than manufacturing. And so historically, capital spending cycles, uh, building out of, even though it's a smaller share of GDP, the multipliers are huge and create a very healthy uh, economy with a uh, lower poverty rate, rising real median family income, um, and stronger productivity growth, which can help actually keep inflation lower longer because of the productivity, which is output per man hour. And so wages do go up um, in this environment. That's what happened in the 1990s. We, even, we have even seen this before. But simultaneously with these uh, capital spending uh, uh, projects, along with, again, this digitization technology that's increasingly embedded in all of these factories, um, actually improves productivity. And therefore, you can have low inflation. Um, transportation costs from China were going through the roof. They were already contributing to higher import prices uh, from China. Today, what we're doing with uh, uh, with our transportation system, trucks in particular, uh, i.e. making them more efficient, battery operated trucks uh, uh, will also help keep um, transportation costs uh, lower longer, less susceptible to surges in gasoline, gasoline prices. So no, um, globalization 2.0 is not inflationary. It creates a healthier economic backdrop. And the investment implications of this slow dance to recession, what are they? How, what should investors be doing to prepare themselves for the eventuality of a recession? Well, increasingly uh, become more defensive in your investments. Over time, uh, treasury bonds certainly, or, or higher interest rates, even within the banking system, um, are good places to park your money. I am an economist. I'm not a money manager or a right. strategist. And so this is, would be from an economist uh, point, of, uh, point of view. Um, and then from a market perspective, moving into those classic uh, uh, defensive areas. But again, I think you have to be more careful than normal. Quality is what our strategy team t uh, talks about. And I think that's, that's really, really key. High quality companies. Uh, careful with some of the foreign uh, investments, um, including, including the EM world. We're bullish on the U.S. dollar. In times of uh, uh, global recessions and times of geopolitical turmoils, the dollar goes up, not down. Um, and that creates problems for U.S. multinationals, but it also creates problems for some of the emerging economies who have a lot of dollar-denominated debt. What is the greatest risk to U.S. economic growth? Not containing inflation uh, would be one. Um, a second, I talked to many emerging market uh, analysts and they, they see this uh, play out in many of their own countries that they follow. And if you don't contain it, uh, you really, really ruin your ability to have a strong economic backstop. That's what happened to us in the 70s. And the dollar obviously went down. Uh, 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 second, you, you, you need responsible government uh, regulation, not egregious uh, government uh, regu regulation. And that's something that we have to always, uh, always worry about. And quite frankly, in Europe and in China, it's worse than it is in the United States. A lot of this is also uh, relative. Um, and you, you do need to hold down government spending in general. Federal outlays right now are very, very elevated. They're about 23% of US GDP. Uh, how does that look like in perspective? It's about where we peaked in the 2008-2009 crisis. So uh, I, I worry more about government spending than I do the budget deficits. 
Um, I, I don't want a big government. I want to take care of, uh, help people who need help. Uh, but government spending right now at about 23 and a half. So I would love for that to come down to just really seal the idea that the U.S. can be the leader in the economy, along with inflation uh, coming back down to that 2%. And one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio. I know you're an economist, but still, you're also an investor. So, what what's the what what should we all own some of? Well, it's going to be tied directly to uh, uh, the manufacturing renaissance. It's the diamonds associated. It's the ETF associated with the Dow Jones, um, uh, which has a lot of obviously high blue chip companies today. Actually, it's it's been outperforming um, the, the market, and so we would suspect it will continue uh, to, out, uh, to outperform. Nancy Lazar, thank you so much for joining us on WealthTrack. You always come up with these uh, actually more optimistic uh, outlook for the U.S. than most of your peers, so I we really appreciate it. I think there's tremendous dynamism in this country, and you tend to spotlight it, so thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much. At the close of every wealth truck, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is take advantage of short-term interest rates. For the first time in over a decade, it pays to invest safe and short-term. Treasury bills and short-term notes, maturities of two years and under, are offering higher yield, and as with all treasuries, their interest is exempt from state and local taxes. There is no need to take on more risk or extend to longer maturities to get decent returns. Next week, Advantage Dividends, Mike Clarfield, Veteran Portfolio Manager of the Clearbridge Dividend Strategy Fund, explains the many benefits of owning dividend-paying stocks. In this week's extra feature, what high-powered, highly-ranked economist Nancy Lazar does to stay at the top of her game. In the meantime, for those of you on social media, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Have a lovely weekend as we welcome spring and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.